Hi, welcome to YTV and this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story. The Ebola virus crisis has dominated news headlines for the past few months, and yesterday it hit close to home as a Yale researcher was admitted into Yale New Haven Hospital with Ebola-like symptoms after returning from a research trip in Liberia. The test results turned out negative, but President Salve sent out an email to the Yale community explaining that Ebola remains a serious concern for all of us. Here to talk about Ebola and its manifestation and the crisis both in Africa and the United States is Christina Talbert Slagle, a lecturer in public health and the senior scientific officer at the Yale Global Health Institute. Dr. Talbert Slagle, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. We've seen Ebola outbreaks in the past uh, in, in Africa. How has this been different? Why has this been so much more potent and spread more rapidly? Mm, good question. In um, well, this particular outbreak, the epidemiology suggests that it actually started in December of 2013 um, with a two-year-old boy in Guinea. And then it spread to his close family members and uh, throughout the community, and then to Sierra Leone where the first cases were reported in March. And then over the summer, um, he came closer to the crisis that we're seeing now. So one of the things that I think we need to note about that is it's actually been ongoing for many months now. And um, early warnings were not um, noted, really, I don't know how else to say it. The um, Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, said we have a crisis many months ago and really the response has been very slow. That's part of the problem. The World Health Organization ignored those warnings. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to point fingers at one particular entity. I think globally, we weren't paying attention. And um, so that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that it has hit in densely populated areas, and it has hit places that are um, war-torn and have little health systems infrastructure. So even though Ebola, the virus, is not that transmissible, if you don't have a health system in place where people can get treatment and susceptible people can be protected, then it will spread to those who are in close contact with someone who is infected, who is releasing bodily fluids, and that's really what's happening. People who are giving care are becoming infected, and there isn't a health systems infrastructure in place to protect them and to prevent that spread from happening. And that, that combination of factors has led to the crisis that we're now seeing in West Africa. There's been a lot of media coverage about this crisis. What are some of the myths you think that have been perpetuated uh, either about these West African countries with Ebola or the virus in particular? Oh, well, one myth, um, or myth, I don't know. I, I always want to be very careful because I think people are entitled to their feelings, including fear. But um, one thing that I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to address is that Ebola is extremely unlikely to become airborne. And let me tell you what that actually means. So uh, Ebola is transmitted in droplets, in liquid droplets that are part of the bodily fluids released from someone who is symptomatic. That means they are very sick and they are releasing fluids. Airborne transmission is something altogether different, meaning that a virus particle can travel across the air and not be in liquid. So the Ebola virus itself is, um, has genetic material that is RNA. So that's different from the genetic material in our cells, which is DNA. RNA mutates a lot when it copies itself. So people have made a jump between the fact that RNA mutates and the potential for this virus to become airborne. Mutation happens randomly. And there is no evidence that this Ebola virus right now in West Africa is mutating toward becoming airborne, nor has any other RNA virus ever mutated to become airborne. So that is something I think that is a source of real fear that is close to unwarranted. It's, it's biologically plausible, which means it has a non-zero chance of happening, but it's extremely unlikely. So I would like for people to know that of the things that worry them, Ebola becoming airborne should be quite low on the list. Um, another um, thing that I think has come up that people worry quite a lot about is um, whether or not we should ban flights. And banning flights would be counterproductive 
for several reasons. One of which is that um, the borders of these countries are porous, so people who want to travel in and out of the country will find a way to do that, with or without infection. If someone were to travel out of the country with infection and flights were banned, and then if that person were to reach anywhere and be symptomatic, we would have no idea how they had traveled, we would have no way of tracing that, we would have no way of then acting proactively to protect people. In addition, banning flights would make it difficult, if not impossible, for healthcare providers to go to these countries where they are desperately needed because they wouldn't be able to come back. So that would make it difficult to address the outbreak. And then finally, banning flights would have a serious negative effect on the economies of these already fragile countries. And we do not want or need to take any steps that would further damage these economies, not only because that would be harmful to them, but because that has negative repercussions for everyone. So that's another issue that I've seen quite a bit that I, I think we need to we want to think differently about that. So do you think that the reporting on health crises like this perpetuates a, a certain negative or even xenophobic view of these African countries in the United States? One of the things that's difficult about this crisis and other health crises in Africa is that for the many, many people who have never been to Africa, it sets up a certain understanding of what the experience in Africa, which is an entire continent, is, or of the many, many countries, which are very different from each other. And um, I do worry that it, some of the reporting um, sets up distinctions which are artificial. People all over the world are the same. And one of the things that's so hard about Ebola is that it has really challenged people's fundamental instincts for caregiving. So if my child were sick with Ebola, I would touch my child, hold my child, do everything that I could to save my child. And that's true for any mother or any parent all over the world, including in West Africa. So I, I w would like to see us somehow connecting in a way to the fundamental humanitarian issue here, which is that people are suffering. And also that people live rich, full lives and have rich, full cu cultures and histories and experiences. And that's true in the US and it's true in all the many countries of Africa as it's true all over the world. And sometimes that gets washed out in the reporting on one specific d disease in one part of the world. So that is a concern. In general, with infectious disease, do you think that the United States is adequately prepared to respond to a crisis like this should we have an epidemic? Okay, well first I want to make clear that I do not think that there's a ch any chance that we'll have an epidemic of Ebola in the United States. Or of, of any infectious disease. Any infectious disease. Um, I do think we're prepared. I think there's a difference between being prepared and expecting that there won't be mistakes. We are humans, we're learning, we learn as we go. And I think the CDC, despite the mistakes that have been made, which have been acknowledged, and I acknowledge them, is a very, um, it's an amazing organization with amazing people. But they are people, and people make mistakes. The key is to learn from those mistakes incorporate that learning into every next step that's made. Make sure that we do a, as best we can on training, preparing, storage of materials. I absolutely do think that we are prepared. I think that being prepared doesn't mean that there won't be mistakes, but the key is we do learn from our mistakes. And that is, that's why I'm not, I think we're gonna be okay. Well, you mentioned mistakes. What lessons do we take from this crisis, which we still need to confront? It's obviously uh, not solved, but in confronting future crises in Africa and elsewhere, whether it's Ebola or, or another health issue. Mm. Well, I think that one lesson from a global health standpoint is that we, um, we err and we make a mistake if we look to a country that has serious um, challenges to its health system or its infrastructure and do nothing. We knew 
that these war-torn countries were um, suffering from broken and weakened systems. And we didn't intervene. And when I say we, I mean the global community, the whole world. And um, that's involved things like underfunding the WHO and just not taking steps to build up systems. And now we're seeing the consequence of those broken systems. So a lesson going forward is let's be proactive. Let's take steps to build nations up so that they have stronger health systems, stronger infrastructure, and are better able to contain something like Ebola or whatever the next threat may be when it hits, rather than reactively scrambling around trying to address a crisis where, as you said, thousands of people have now died. Speaking of war-torn countries, you mentioned countries with not a lot of infrastructure. Uh, you co-authored a piece in CNN with General Stanley McChrystal, who's a Jackson Institute fellow here, about the similarities between Ebola and ISIS. Can you elaborate on that a little sure, bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, General McChrystal and I have had a collaboration for some months now exploring the idea that countries that have an underlying vulnerability are susceptible to what we're thinking of as opportunistic threats. And the framework we're really thinking about there is a nation being similar to a human body. So the human body is a complex entity with many interconnected systems. And when all those systems are functioning well, we're healthy. And we're able to fight off threats like a yeast infection or um, Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono. Many of us have that. Like 90% of people have that in their bodies. When the human body breaks down from some underlying cause, like immunodeficiency, then we become susceptible to what are called opportunistic infections, like yeast infection, which can suddenly make you very sick or actually kill you. It turns out the same thing is true for a nation. A nation that has had long-term breakdown, like Afghanistan, where General McChrystal was the commander, um, is susceptible to opportunistic threats, like Al-Qaeda, which was actually not that well organized of a group at the beginning. We have worked on that idea for some time, and then with the advent of Ebola in these war-torn countries and ISIS in these war-torn countries, we started to think this is, this is a very similar thing. What we're seeing is nations that have had long-term breakdown in systems due to conflict, which are now susceptible to opportunistic threats that a healthier nation like the US can more easily defend itself against. So that was the premise of the article. That's the theoretical premise. And then the next step is we have to deal with both the opportunistic threats and rebuild the nations, the underlying, address the underlying susceptibility in order to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Well, in rebuilding that infrastructure mm -hmm. and going to help, what role do you think Yale and the Yale global health community can play? Great question. Um, so one thing that's uh, um, a signature piece of research for the Yale Global Health Leadership Institute has been health system strengthening. And that's a set of programming that um, is in place and has been in place in many parts of the world and in Africa, which is really looking at uh, the health system as a whole and how to build it up. So the overarching objective would be for people to go into their health system, trust it, and get high quality, safe, reliable care, and have mechanisms for paying for that or financing mechanisms in place and strong leadership and management systems. So in, we have a real expertise here at Yale in order to, uh, to devote to health systems strengthening. And that's something that we can do long term in order to build up the health systems of these fragile nations. And then of course there are many highly trained clinicians that some of whom I would imagine, I don't know, but are, would contribute their services. We have world fellows here who have expertise in international policy and local and regional responses that can contribute scholarship, which I believe is ongoing. Um, we have also had some conversations around the idea of global health security, thinking about what does it mean to have nations secure against threats like Ebola that are really a serious concern. So I think we have many ways that we can contribute across campus. Christina talbert Slagle, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. And as always, thank you for joining us. For YTV, I'm Cody Pomerantz, and this has been Everybody Has a Story. See you next time.